Chapter 5 of Book 1 of Les Miserables, Volume 2 by Victor Hugo. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Les Miserables, Volume 2 by Victor Hugo. Translated by Isabel Florence Hapgood. Book 1, Waterloo. Chapter 5, The Quid Obscurum of Battle. Everyone is acquainted with the first phase of this battle, a beginning which was troubled, uncertain, hesitating, menacing to both armies, but still more so for the English than for the French. It had rained all night. The earth had been cut up by the downpour. The water had accumulated here and there in the hollows of the plain, as if in casks. At some points, the gear of the artillery carriages was buried up to the axles, the circangles of the horses were dripping with liquid mud. If the wheat and rye trampled down by this cohort of transports on the land had not filled in the ruts and strewn a litter beneath the wheels, all movement, particularly in the valleys, in the direction of the papillot, would have been impossible. The affair began late. Napoleon, as we have already explained, was in the habit of keeping all his artillery well in hand, like a pistol aiming it now at one point, now at another, of the battle, and it had been his wish to wait until all the horse batteries could move and gallop freely. In order to do that, it was necessary that the sun should come out and dry the soil. But the sun did not make its appearance. It was no longer the rendezvous of Austerlitz. When the first cannon was fired, the English general, Colville, looked at his watch and noted that it was thirty-five minutes past eleven. The action was begun furiously, with more fury perhaps than the emperor would have wished, by the left wing of the French resting on Hougoumont. At the same time Napoleon attacked the center by hurling Quillot's brigade on La Haye Sainte, and Ney pushed forward the right wing of the French against the left wing of the English, which rested on Papillot. The attack on Hougoumont was something of a feint. The plan was to draw Wellington thither, and to make him swerve to the left. This plan would have succeeded if the four companies of the English guards and the brave Belgians of Perponche's division had not held the position solidly, and Wellington, instead of massing his troops there, could confine himself to dispatching thither, as reinforcements, only four more companies of guards and one battalion from Brunswick. The attack of the right wing of the French on Papillot was calculated, in fact, to overthrow the English left, to cut off the road to Brussels, to bar the passage against possible Prussians, to force Mont Saint Jean to turn Wellington back on Hougoumont, thence on Brain la Lue, thence on Howe, nothing easier. With the exception of a few incidents, this attack succeeded. Papillot was taken, La Haisant was carried. A detail to be noted. There was in the English infantry, particularly in Kempt's brigade, a great many raw recruits. These young soldiers were valiant in the presence of our redoubtable infantry. Their inexperience extricated them intrepidly from the dilemma. They performed particularly excellent service as skirmishers. The soldier skirmisher, left somewhat to himself, becomes, so to speak, his own general. These recruits displayed some of the French ingenuity and fury. This novice of an infantry had dash. This displeased Wellington. After the taking of La Haye Sainte, the battle wavered. There is in this day an obscure interval, from midday to four o'clock. The middle portion of this battle is almost indistinct, and participates in the somberness of the hand-to-hand -hand conflict. Twilight reigns over it. We perceive vast fluctuations in that fog. A dizzy mirage, a paraphernalia of war almost unknown today. Pendant coalbacks, floating sabertaches, cross belts, cartridge boxes for grenades, hussar dolmens, red boots with a thousand wrinkles, heavy shakos garlanded with torsades. The almost black infantry of Brunswick mingled with the scarlet infantry of England, the English soldiers with great white circular pads on the slopes of their shoulders for epaulets, the Hanoverian light horse with their oblong cask of leather, with brass hands and red horse tails, the Scotch with their bare knees and plaids, the great white gaiters of our grenadiers, pictures, not strategic lines. What Salvator Rosa requires, not what is suited to the needs of Gribbeval. A certain amount of tempest is always mingled with a battle. Quid obscurum, quid divinum. 
each historian traces to some extent the particular features which please him amid this pell-mell whatever may be the combinations of the generals the shock of armed masses as an incalculable ebb during the action the plans of the two leaders enter into each other and become mutually thrown out of shape such a point of the field of battle devours more combatants than such another just as more or less spongy soil soak up more or less quickly the water which is poured on them it becomes necessary to pour out more soldiers than one would like a series of expenditures which are foreseen the line of battle waves and undulates like a thread the trails of blood gush illogically the fronts of the armies waver the regiments form capes and gulfs as they enter and withdraw all these reefs are continually moving in front of each other where the infantry stood the artillery arrives the cavalry rushes in where the artillery was the battalions are like smoke there was something there seek it it has disappeared the open spots change the sombre folds advance and retreat a sort of wind from the sepulchre pushes forward hurls back distends and disperses these tragic multitudes what is a fray an oscillation the immobility of a mathematical plan expresses a minute not a day in order to depict a battle there is required one of those powerful painters who have chaos in their brushes rembrandt is better than van der Meulen. van der Meulen, exact at noon lies at three o'clock geometry is deceptive the hurricane alone is trustworthy that is what confers on Follard the right to contradict Polybius. Let us add, there is a certain instant when the battle degenerates into a combat, becomes specialized, and disperses into innumerable detailed feats, which, to borrow the expression of Napoleon himself, belong rather to the biography of the regiments than to the history of the army. The historian has, in this case, the evident right to sum up the whole. He cannot do more than seize the principal outlines of the struggle, and it is not given to any one narrator, however conscientious he may be, to fix absolutely the form of that horrible cloud which is called about. This, which is true of all great armed encounters, is particularly applicable to Waterloo. Nevertheless, at a certain moment in the afternoon, the battle came to a point. End of Book 1, Chapter 5